Welcome to Insights into Physics. My name is Rose and here is my colleague Jack. We're interviewing researchers at Black Lab in Imperial College London. Today we are speaking to Ulrich Egeder, a particle physicist who is largely involved in the LHCB project at CERN in Switzerland, as well as the Grid Cloud Computing project. Good afternoon. Uh, we have with us uh, Ulrich Egeder. Please introduce yourself to us. Okay. Uh, my name is Ulrich Egeder. I work in the uh, particle physics group here at Imperial College, where uh, I put my research into trying to understand some of the most fundamental questions in the universe, you can really say. I'm looking into differences between matter and antimatter, trying to understand what we call the standard model of particle physics, trying to basically crack open the whole thing. Particle physics involves the standard model. Uh, where do you look for, for new physics? What we call new physics is basically somehow, you know, what sits what we call sits beyond the standard model. Because indeed, yes, the standard model was devised some uh, 30 years ago, and it uh, has been able to explain to a remarkable level of precision everything we have seen out there. But, as I just mentioned, at the same time we know that it's not a complete theory. So, for example, you know, where dark matter, as we know from astrophysics, exists in the universe, what that is. So, one of the ways that I, in my own research, try to work out this is to take an approach where we look for how we can create new particles, new types of particles in the universe, indirectly. So, for example, as you see in the image here, we have a point over here where the protons and protons collide. We get a very large cascade of particles out through this. Mm -hmm. And simply by understanding the distribution of this, their relative momentum, etc., we try to understand what process happened down there at a scale of maybe, you know, 10 to the um, minus 12 seconds or something like that. What happened in the first 10 to the minus 12 seconds of this process? So, uh, at CERN there are plenty of experiments. You're working on specifically our LHCB. Yes. What is the aim of your particular experiment? The aim of the LHCB experiment is a very shortly indeed to look at this indirect production of new particles. So uh, in particular that we hope this will be able to uh, make us understand better the difference between matter and antimatter in the universe. Uh, a lot of what we do nowadays is we conduct analysis in a way where we say we conduct a blind analysis. And what we mean by this is uh, pretty much the same what you mean when you conduct a blind analysis in medicine, that you don't know who you're giving the real medicine to, who you're giving the placebo to. What we try to do is that the fraction of the data that we somehow can extract the knowledge of this new physics out of, we do not look at that when we somehow put together the whole structure of our computing programs to extract the result. We blind ourselves to that bit. When we then put everything together, agree this is the way we're going to do the analysis, then we look at that data, which is a very exciting moment always. Somehow this, you've done all this work, you might have worked for a year or more on some particular topic and you somehow haven't seen the real thing yet and then at some point you decide we're going to unblind as we call it you know and it's a pretty exciting moment because usually you have everything ready so it usually only takes two minutes to do it mm -hmm. so you've been working all this time along and then suddenly you sit there you look at the result and you know sometimes it's sort of you know really good or sometimes it's sort of, you know a bit of it has been sort of along the way of you know oh, you know standard model again you know we didn't manage to crack it here but we have maybe in the last year, found a few small cracks in the standard model, and okay. we're very much following up on that now. As a result of the work being done at CERN, a lot of data is being generated. Um, there is this project called um, Great Cloud Computing. How does it work? How has it arised out of CERN? The uh, Great Computing, or indeed Cloud Computing, uh, is very much a concept of that you uh, do your computing in a way where you do not really care too much about where the computers that do your very heavy processing is, where your data is, etc. And that's something that applies very much to particle physics. Particle physics collaborations in general exist you know, all across the world. I have close collaborators sitting in Brazil, America, China, and the rest of Europe, etc. And that's where grid computing comes in. It allows me to somehow just say, I want this computer program to run on that data 
and then the grid will somehow match it up in a way where it will say, ah, there's free computing resources here at this place that also happens to have a data. I will do your processing there. I will return the result to you. I'll put it all together from the different parts that were partly computed in America, partly uh, in France, uh, and give it back to me. So grid computing serves as a way of basically making our life easier. So now we're going to talk a bit more about your career and how you became a physicist here yeah. at Imperial. And we would like to ask you, why inspired you to do particle physicist? I think it's a long story. The, uh, I think uh, as many uh, children that are interested in science, I was very much interested in the, uh, in the uh, stars, in uh, astronomy, etc. I was lucky enough to grow up in a place where you had proper dark skies, right? not in London. <laughs> You know, so I could see the Milky Way, I could see the planets, etc. So, so probably since I was about ten years old, or so I had a you know strong interest in, in understanding the universe as such. You know, and uh, I went into university in Copenhagen in Denmark uh, to study physics with somehow a strong vision of that I wanted to become an astronomer or do astrophysics. Uh, however, teaching in that area was not particularly good at the time. Uh, uh, so, so I just got a little bit disappointed by it somehow. Then I went on and thought, oh well, uh, maybe I want to do you know, glaciology, uh, go to Greenland, which is a part of Denmark, it could be really cool, do research up there, etc. Uh, but then somehow by chance I got, the, uh, I got to become a um, summer student at CERN in Geneva, which is where about 120 students go every year from all over the world, set of lectures, you get coupled up with uh, some of the researchers in the lab to work on some project, etc. And I was just sold to particle physics from that. You know, it, it was a cool environment to work in. You really felt somehow that you were part of some research. So, where did you choose your PhD? So, I took the opportunity to go to London, Sweden, where I then did my PhD uh, for four years, working on the development of what now is called the Atlas Detector. In Geneva. So I worked on somehow designing how the instrument should actually look like, testing small parts of it in sort of what we call test beams of particles and so on. And um, how did your career evolve once you finished your PhD? Uh, at that point I was somehow really wanting to, rather than designing particle physics for the future, which I'd done for my PhD, I wanted to do particle physics now. <laughs> uh, so I. Uh, uh, I got a job at uh, Rutherford Abbotton Laboratories, which lies just south of Oxford, to work on the what's called the Baba experiment that was located at uh, SLAC at Stanford University. Then from there on, uh, one of the collaborators I had there basically encouraged me to uh, apply for a job here at Imperial, and I've been here at Imperial since uh, 2001. And how is your life as a researcher? What sort of what occupies your days? What occupies my days? Uh, many things. Uh, a typical day can contain a uh, discussion with my postgraduate students. To a large extent, it's the postgraduate students that do the real work, you know, to write the programs, you know, do it, etc. But there's so many discussions going on back and forth. Have you looked at it in this way, etc.? It involves reading papers, uh, both the papers that we somehow as a collaboration of writing ourselves, making sure that they actually express correctly what we have done, etc. But of course also reading new theory papers coming in, uh, looking at, do they interpret what we've done in a good way, do they come up with a new idea, what we should look for. Mm -hmm. Undergraduate teaching, of course, forms a part of it as well. A lot of it is about talking to other people, actually. Uh, you know, coming up with ideas, etc. that, you know, the coffee break is, uh, at CERN, you know, going for coffee is, you know, a really famous thing, you know, that's what you do when you do that, you go for coffee when you want to talk to somebody, <laughs> uh, and especially if you're there for a short day, uh, you know, for a few days, or if you're shortly, you know, you can end up totally, you know, caffeine addicted, because you, <laughs> you realise at the end of the day you've gone for eight coffees, you know, to talk to people, but it's very much somehow part of the social fabric this, you go and talk to people informally in order to extract the new ideas, or maybe to raise a, you know, slightly tricky issue, you know, you know, they are working on some analysis in a way that's not quite compatible with the way we are working. Let's try to sort it out together and so on. And you do that in an informal setting. Okay, and for those undergrads, looking back at your career, what would you recommend or if you had a tip or a piece of advice to give them, what would you say? I would, which probably became clear a little bit from the way I've sort of moved around, is pick the opportunities that arise. Don't somehow try to set your 
goal for something that might be, you know, unobtainable. You know, if somebody comes along, you talk to somebody during your lab sessions or works on something cool in their research, whatever, ask them, you know, don't be afraid of asking. Ask them, can I do a project with you next year? Can I do a fourth year project with you? And they'll probably say, yes, you can do that, even if they hadn't actually written an official form with it and so on. So pick up on opportunities. Go and talk to researchers, you know, if they're in the office, they're usually very easily approachable and so on. So that's my biggest advice. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. It's been a lovely interview. I hope okay. your research goes well.